Okay, thank you. So I want to teach you how to really solve a strongly co correlated model on the right kind of hardware. Because this school is about, okay, you win two different microphones. Yes, right. Okay. One is for recording, one is for the room. No, that's not. Okay, good. Okay, so I want to teach you how to solve quantum systems on a quantum computer. <laughs> who of you brought a computer with you? And who, who brought a quantum computer? <laughs> Nobody yet, you're laughing now, but I think within your lifetime, if you stay in physics, you will use one. Within the next three or four years, a toy pro toy machine in five years, something interesting, and in 10 years or 20 years, it might become what you just use in class even. And so I want to teach you how you will use one once you get one, because if you stay in physics, then you will use one. So you, you should start and learn now, now how you use it and what to, to, to use it for. But first, you had two weeks of lectures. Lots of different methods this morning on DFT and so on, and full CI and couple of clusters. And it was always, it's hard and you can't do much and it's hard and so on. Why is it hard? It's hard because we're trying to simulate a quantum system on a classical computer. Now, classical computers have been around for a long time. Let's see if this, no, this doesn't work. So let me just click here. The first ones were, were done in Greece. Chris, Chris, a hundred year PC people built an, a machine with like 30 wheels that could calculate the positions of the planets and the moon and the stars. It was very complex at the time. Then, a long time, nothing much. And then, in the 19th century, Lord Kelvin built a four year analyzer that could predict the tides in the channel. It was a complex machine that could do a Fourier transform in an analog way. It is easy to build such an analog computer because basically you build something that when it runs works according to the equations you want to solve and by running it solves the equations. They're simple but they're hard to scale, and they're hard to calibrate. People built machines to, 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 to add numbers, plus multiply them. They worked well, were easy and fast, but you couldn't go to more than four digits. And if you want to sum up a million euros, and two million euros, and five euros, then you need six digits, or seven digits. So, so then people switched to like a digital machines like the ENIAC. Those machines were much harder to build. They took much longer to build, but they were general purpose. You can program many different things on one and not just what you can build with your Legos. They can also correct for errors simply by doing the same calculation twice or three times and checking how many agree and that's the number you trust. And they're scalable and you can build it up and scale it and now we have, have like a big machines like the Milky Way 2 machine which runs really amazingly fast. And with Moore's law, things go exponentially. We had over the last 50 years, an exponential increase in the speed of the fastest machine that's here drawn from the 1990 to now. And basically, the speed doubles every year on average. So within uh, 10 years, we get a machine that's 1,000 times faster. So things that were slow uh, 10 years ago uh, will be no problem now. We have this exponential increase, and that seems like we should, at some point, be able to do whatever we want. With doubling, we can do full CI, and basically, every two years, we can add one more orbital to it. 
and in 20 years we'll have 10 more orbitals, in 50 years we'll have 25 more, so you just need to wait and at some point we can do thousands. But there are two problems. The first problem is we get this fact, okay, first I don't want to wait 50 years to get 25 more orbitals. The second problem is that we get this factor of a thousand increase in 10 years by making the CPUs faster by factor 10, and the rest comes by putting in 100 times more CPU cores per decade. Going up from about 10 to about 1,000, 10,000 and 3 million now, and soon about a billion. But even using 3 million cores means you have to write the code that you can parallelize over 3 million different cores. And that means that 99.99993% of your code has to be perfectly parallel, or you can't even split your task over 3 million cores. Just think you want to do something, and I give you 3 million students to help you. It's hard to use them sensibly. The next problem is power consumption. As long as you could just shrink the transistors in three dimensions, it all worked nicely, and the power used stayed constant. And the supercomputer needed always less than a megawatt of power. But now, the scaling has stopped in the th 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 third dimensions because you cannot make an like, insulating layer less than about four atomic layers thick. So the two might still work when you go to one or half an atomic layer, then it's no longer insulating. So the scaling is now just in two dimensions, and the consequence is the power consumption is going up. And it's going up exponentially recently. And because it, it used to be about the megawatt, then three, now it's about 20, and we could build a machine now that runs at an exaflop or more, but we might have to use uh, the gigawatt of power, which would be, and one megawatt of power costs about a million euros per year, so a gigawatt would cost about a billion euros per year just for the power bill. I don't think we get that money for our calculations. So there's the problem here, and what people think about in hyperformance computing is what can you do when to go beyond the exascale, so beyond what we're thinking of that we might be able to build in the next years. And when they ask that question, then they're not just referring to a yatta flop, meaning 10 to the 21 flops, so a factor of 1,000 more than now, but just thinking about what can one build to do things that, is, that are just impossible to think of now. What can we do that will like, let us do totally new things that we can't do now? And one of those ideas is to define men. He wrote uh, a paper in 1982 where he asked the question about what are the limits of simulating physics with computers. Can you take a physical system and simulate its evolution? Can it be done? And I think you all sit here because you believe it's possible. But what we know is for quantum system, it's really, really hard. And that's why you had the lectures on the many different approximate methods or limited methods. QMC works without the sign problem. The DFT works when the relations are weak and so on. But when it's strongly correlated, then things just get hard. And Feynman then had the great idea to say, okay, if we want to simulate a quantum system on a computer, then on a classical computer it's hard. But then he had the idea to just use quantum elements in the computer to actually simulate quantum physics. So if you build a computer that works not based on classical physics, but on quantum physics, then he argued it should be efficient to simulate a quantum system. So one could build this so-called quantum 
computer to simulate quantum physics. And that's when that word first came up. And it was invented for simulating quantum physics. Now, why do we talk about quantum computers today? We talk about it not because people found it such a great idea that we should invest lots and lots of money to solve quantum problems. That was a great theoretical idea, but nobody was excited to say, yes, I need to build a quantum computer now. Who knows what changed it? Yeah? Yes, there was Shor's algorithm that later on, like Peter Shaw found out that if you had a quantum computer that you might build, build, build think of following the Feynman's ideas, then you can use that to factor integers. Let's say 21 is 3 times 7. Why is that interesting? It's not interesting because that's such an interesting problem to factor integers, but it's interesting because it is classically hard and nobody knows any efficient algorithm to factor integers. And that's why this is the basis of what we use now for like a public like a key and the encryption systems for your e-banking and so on. It's all based on the fact that if you have two prime numbers, when you multiply them, you get a big number and it's very, very hard to find those prime factors. If you have just the product, you can encrypt it, but to decrypt the message, you need to know the prime factors. Because that is hard, classically, this is a good crypto system. But if you had a quantum computer, then you could find out the prime factors and you break it. And so if you have a quantum computer, then you can use it to break encryption systems. And that led to the big interest in people think about building one. Now, why do they build one? Because it's so interesting to crack encryption. Is that the reason? I don't think so, because people have now worked already on post-quantum cryptography. You can think of systems, crypto systems, that you cannot crack with a quantum computer. So the moment we have a quantum computer, we just change our software, and we're safe. So that's not the application. But it costs interest because, and, and I think the main application is not because you want to crack encryption. Because already years before we'll have a big quantum computer that can do it, we'll switch crypto system. So if you're some entity who has some old documents, 20 year old ones, you still want to decrypt, then yes, then you need it. But I think the main reason of the interest is you want to know whether the enemy can build a quantum computer. So whether you want to know whether your crypto system is still safe. And the only way to make sure that the others don't have one is you need to be the best and you need to try and build one yourself. If you can't build one, you're pretty sure the others also can't build one. But if you can, then you know your system is unsafe and you have to change crypto system. But once you change, you don't need the quantum computer anymore. So that's not the real application. The real application, I think, will be doing quantum physics in the end. But we might get one because of code breaking. What do we have at the moment? We have devices you can buy in Switzerland that give you quantum random numbers, perfect random numbers. It's impossible to get it classically. This classically everything is deterministic. You can do quantum crypto systems. You can encrypt information using think near quantum mechanics that it's, it's, it's provably safe. You can build a quantum simulator that's an analog device using, for example, the quantum gases to simulate a quantum system. Again, like in the classical world, analog is easier to build. These things exist. 
already now for uh, like millions of particles. But like in the classical case, they're limited by the calibration problems, cooling and temperature problems. And you can only build whatever the particles, the Lagos you use, have as their couplings interactions. It's not flexible. If you were to build something uh, digital, then it's more flexible, but it's much harder to build. You might have heard about D-Wave, the quantum optimizer. We don't really know yet how much such a system could do. They built one just because it can be built now. It works. It's not faster than a PC at the moment. How it scales, nobody knows yet. But what we know is if we have a quantum computer, then, we can, then there are many things we can do that we cannot do classically. But this takes a bit longer to build. But if we have one, OK, let me just stop here a bit now and ask who of you knows what a quantum computer is and how it's built and how it works. Besides, Bela, you should stop talking. <laughs> You're building one, aren't you? <laughs> who of you is building a quantum computer? Who of you has used a quantum computer? Who of you has heard about the quantum computer? <laughs> who knows how it, oh yeah, yes, I told you about it now. <laughs> who knows how it works? A few. OK, so basically, it's a computer, like a classical one. But instead of bits, it uses quantum bits or qubits. And classical bits can either be 0 or 1. And the qubit is something that can be in a quantum superposition of near zero and one. So it can be something like alpha times zero plus beta times one. And you all know that there's just the simple spin half system. Just like alpha times up spin plus beta times down spin. If you know what the spin half is, then you know what the qubit is. And why does that make a difference? In classical computing, there's the, the Church-Turing thesis, which states that basically every type of classical computer you could build is essentially equivalent, be it a cell phone, a computer, and a Turing machine, it makes no difference. They all can basically do the same thing efficiently. And solving quantum systems is hard. What Feynman said is that if you take such quantum bits and build a quantum computer, then you can do things that no classical computer can do efficiently. And basically, you see that already here. Classically, we have one bit. In a quantum bit, I need two complex numbers to store the state of one qubit. Of course, alpha squared plus beta squared has to be one. So it's just then a bit fewer numbers. But if you want to precisely store it, you need infinite precision. So you need to know two complex numbers to infinite precision to just represent the state of a single qubit. Now, we might not want to get infinite, so just we need to store two complex numbers. What if we go to n qubits? When we go to n qubits, then you have n spin 1 half, and we need, of course, two to the n complex numbers to store the state. That's the problem why it's hard to simulate the quantum system, because my state can be just the sum of all possible states of the qubits i1 to i n, some constant, let's call it a i1 to a n to, to i n. 
times the state which has the first one in the state i1, i2, and so on, up to in. I just have to store that vector and the Hilbert space is large. So you see, a quantum register of n qubits, if you want to describe its state in a pure state, needs two to the n complex numbers. So it needs a huge amount of classical information. And that tells you that it might be able to do much, much more than any classical computer. And you could think you have exponential advantage. But it's not so easy, because the problem is, what can you obtain if I give you these n spin one halves, these n qubits? Let's say I give you n qubits. How much information can you tell me? You can measure the qubits, right? That's all you can do. And when, but, and when we measure a qubit, we get either a zero or a one. We just get the classical state. I measure this, the second qubit, I either get zero or one. So when I measure the measurement gives only n bits of information. So to describe the state, I need two to the n complex numbers. And he has this immense information need to be described. But when I want to read out something, I get very, very little. I mean, it's just n classical bits. Just n bits. That's what's written here. I think this screen is in the way, is it? Yeah. I don't think we can move it. We can just tilt it. Yeah, that's all. So that shows you that it has immense power or potential, but it's very limited at the same time. And that's actually the good news, because some magic solution doesn't exist. There's, n there's no magic device that can do t t t t t t t anything. But because this is limited, but still has this potential, it might help us. So. The next problem we have. So this is the good news, the bad news. The next bad news is called no cloning. Who knows about the no cloning theorem? About a third. No cloning simply means if I give you this quantum register here, and I ask you to make a copy of it, it's impossible. We can't do it. And it's basically easy to, to, to see. The simplest way is I take some state psi that you want to copy, and it gives you some like empty register as well. Let me call it zero. And what I want to do from this, I want to create psi in the copy of psi. And the easiest way of seeing that there's a problem is I might just want to start with a zero. And zero, zero has to go over into zero, zero. And one, one has to go over in, no, sorry, and one zero goes over into one, one. I'm copying the one here now. And now I apply the same cloner to a super position, then if I apply the cloner to alpha zero plus beta one and zero, then I just get the superposition of these things, then I get an alpha times zero zero plus a beta times one one which is not what, what I wanted, because what I wanted was psi psi, which would have been alpha times zero plus beta times one. And the next one is also alpha times zero plus beta times one. Yeah. Why has it to be linear? 
Why does it have to be be linear? Can you do something nonlinear? Okay, we we can try. Let's say you give me something, some magic thing. Let me prove that is not possible. And the way I prove it is, it should be able to clone any arbitrary state. And whatever it does, it has to be unitary. So let me start with the state psi zero. And I calculate its norm. And I take another state, phi, for which it should work. It should work for any state that I give you, because you don't know the state beforehand. So let me calculate. So And we have your cloner. The cloner takes this over into psi psi. The cloner takes this into phi phi. Right? And the cloner does not change the norm. It's unitary. It does not change the, 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 the inner products either. So let me apply this to, and let me calculate the inner product of these two. That inner product is 0, phi, psi, 0. Which is just phi psi because that is 1. That has to be the same as the inner product after my unitary cloner, which is phi psi, which is phi phi, psi psi, which is phi psi squared. For this to be true, that can only be true if phi psi is either 0 or 1. So your cloner can only work if the two states are identical or orthogonal. It can't work for a general state. Because quantum mechanics is unitary in the time evolution. So we can't even copy. And that's another restriction we have. In classical computing copying, we do all the time. We copy variables. We write codes in parallel, we copy our inputs, farm it out, run it on the million cores, collect it. We can't do that with quantum information. So we have another restriction. We can't even copy our states. But we still have this big potential. So now let us think about Let, let's say we want to describe what such a quantum computer does on a classical computer. If you want to store the state of 10 quantum bits, I need to store 2 to the 10 complex numbers, which takes 16 kilobytes of memory. My watch has more. I can simulate the unitary operation on that in microseconds. So with 10 qubits, my watch can do it easily. If we have 20 qubits, it takes megabytes of memory. It takes milliseconds on my phone. Could do it here. If you have 30 qubits, it takes 16 gigabytes. Okay, it needs a big laptop, and it takes seconds. Now it's getting slower. I need my laptop. With 40 qubits, I need 16 terabytes. That's a big machine, and it takes minutes. With 50 qubits, I need 16 petabytes of memory. That's kind of the biggest, biggest mega machines that exists. And I need it for days just to do a single operation. With 60 quantum bits, it needs 16 exabytes. We don't even have that yet on any machine. It would take a very long time. If you go to about 80 qubits, the memory just fits into the, the, the visible universe, and the time is longer than the, the age of the universe. So when we go to 80, 100, or 200 qubits, then we just have no way to simulate what it does. So we have this thing here that's basically spin one-halves. 
our quantum bits. And we can do two things on that. And once we have more than about 50 or 60, then this thing can do things that we cannot simulate classically. The challenge is, what would we use it for? And where are we? How do we get such qubits? Who, who has a qubit at home? Or in the lab, or has a friend who has a qubit? Yeah? You can use uh, uh, superconducting circuits, use fluxes, for example. You can use, what do you say? Ions, ions, yes, you can encode it in the motional state of ions. You can even use quantum spins, spin up and spin down, that's quantum spins. You can use many things. The problem is we want to isolate them totally. Because I want this qubit to stay coherent forever. We basically want to build the Schrodinger cat. Who has seen a Schrodinger cat? Nobody yet, because it's hard because of something at big coherence. So you want to actually have something very, very isolated. The best ones are uh, 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 bit, bit, bit like north of here, here the like ions in, in the, the like Innsbruck group. They have they are 20 ions trapped nicely, They're isolated. When you don't touch them, they stay coherent for many hours. When you work on them, you can do about 100 operations, and then they start to decohere. They might go up to about 40 or 50. That will take about five years, they guess. The operation times are slow. It takes microseconds for the operation while your laptop runs at 0.3 nanoseconds of gate times. Superconducting qubits are much faster. They live much shorter, about, about like 100 the microseconds only. But the gates are much faster, so you can still do about 100 operations as well. It's easier to scale them. You can, you can take a trap, and you trap in it 20 IS, maybe 50. But beyond that means you, pull, you use more boxes. Super conducting qubits, you build on a chip, and you can more easily scale it up. But the more you build, the more noise there is, the more coupling there is, and it gets harder to keep it nice and clean. You could go much better if you have had a topological qubit. I think Bela is working on one, or his companies. The idea there is if you can encode the qubit in, in a topological property of a quantum state, then no local noise can know the state, and so, so no local noise can actually destroy the state as well. And you can do that, in principle, if you f f find like, the, the, the Majorana anions. They, 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 they may exist in some like, quantum wires. We don't know yet for sure. If they exist, then these might live much, much longer and would make it easier to build a quantum computer. But we don't know yet. So. We are that we have about 20 quantum bits so far, and we might soon have 30, 40, 50, or 100. Once we get to 100, it starts getting interesting. So what do we then do with it? Let's do that. And so the first ingredient are the qubits we need. The second ingredient is we need the uh, in a classical computer to, to control them. And the third ingredient is we need to actually do something with the qubits. And that was also already shown by Feynman. And 
he did it just like for, for classical bits. What do we do with classical bits? If I give you a, a bunch of classical bits, how do you compute something with them? You reduce it, yes. So you don't say, I use Python. <laughs> but basically, what you can do deep down in the hardware, you reduce it to very simple operation. And you want to work on many bits, but we can't build any program just from having things that work on a single bit or two bit. The simplest thing, if I have a single bit, and that's a line that feeds in the bit, now I can do, for example, a NOT gate. That's a gate. I feed in A here, and I get out not A. If I feed in 0, I get out 1. If I feed in 1, I get out 0. Then I can build more gates. I can build a classical AND gate. The AND gate gets in A, B, and the output is C. Take in A, B, and the output is C. If I get a 0, 0, I get 0, 0, 1, no. 0, 0, 1 is 0, 1, 0 is 0, and 1, 1 only is 1. That's the AND operation. C is equal to A and B. Who knows other gates? Yeah? What? Or? Yeah, can build an OR gate. Let's see, equal A or B. I can build an XOR gate. C equal A, XOR, B. And I can think of many, many, many gates. But what has been shown is that theoretically, you need only a single gate to actually implement any classical algorithm. So if I give you a bunch of classical bits and a single gate that you can get get many, many times, then you can, with that, write any code you want to write. And that's which gate? NAND. There's the NAND gate, the NOT AND. So if I give you the NAND gate, that's enough. I just give you a pile of NAND gates and some classical bits, and you can write down a circuit that can do any classical computation. It's easy. From the NAND gate, we can build a NOT gate, just by feeding this, the same signal into here, we get a NOT. Then with NOT and AND, they can make an OR, and so on, and the kid can build up any gate they want and any program they want just with a pile of NAND gates. So it's homework. You should write a program to multiply two numbers with eight bits and just with NAND gates. And you can sit down and start writing it. So it can be done in principle. And it might be nice to actually do that, but not, f f okay, why don't you just do at night, take NAND gates and write something to add two one-bit numbers. And you can write down a circuit and do it. The reason why it's instructive to do that is because on the quantum side, we usually work at the same low level. You would never do it classically. You just call Python and type 3 plus 7, for example, and it works. But deep down, the hardware is operating on those gates. And what I teach you now, now on the quantum side is at the same low level. So what Feynman proposed is you can do the same on the quantum side. All you, so, what we, so what can we do on a quantum computer? We take some state psi, and the only thing we can do is we can take that over into some, some unitary operator u times psi. That's all we can do in quantum mechanics, but it's enough. If we can do that for an arbitrary unitary, then we can do anything that we want to do. Now, I don't want to make an arbitrary unitary simply because this is extremely hard to do. Just to write down this matrix, this is a 2n times 
2 to, to the n times 2 to the n matrix. There's no way I can build this operation with less that, that than negative 4 to the n hardware because I need to feed in the numbers. So the only reasonable way is to, to, to do the same as in the classical computing. And we want to look at simple gates that act just on one or on two qubits. And there are many, many gates you can think about. And most of them you know. Let's look at single qubit gates first. You can take in a qubit, and I can apply some unitary operation to it. And the simplest might be a sigma C operation. A C gate. That's the input, that's the output. How do I write what it does? It is not just a truth table, but it's a matrix now. The basis is just 0 and 1. And that basis, that matrix is just sigma C, 1, 0, 0, minus 1. What else can I do? You might have guessed it. I can do a sigma x matrix. I can do a sigma y. These are the Pauli gates. For these gates, I cannot build any arbitrary matrix. What I can do then is I can do next to the Hadamard gate, gate to H. And that is a matrix 1 over root 2 times 1, 1, 1, minus 1. And what that does is it changes the state. So that for a spin flips the z axis to the x axis. So this takes the state 0 into 1 over root 2 times 0 plus 1, and it takes the state 1 into 1 over root 2 of 0 minus 1. So it takes the plus x state, uh, sorry, the plus c state into plus x, and the minus c state into minus x. Then there's something which I call the hy gate, or it's sometimes called y basis, or sometimes y, that is so y might might mean uh, no, more things. That is one over root two times one i i one. That takes the plus z state into plus y and minus z into minus y. Then we might do more. We might apply phases. So you can do a phase gate. Let me call that theta. And that phase gate just does 1, 0, 0, and e to the i theta. Now, I have a problem with that gate. Who sees a problem with this gate? if I want to build it. Yeah? It's unitary. They, data can take any value. So how do I calibrate it? How do I control it? It's, a, it's an analog gate, right? I can choose any value f for data, and I might need to control it to 10 to the minus 20, and this is just very, very hard. I can't do that in general. So what people like doing is just some discrete angles that they can really control well. That, that's much easier. 
And so we don't like that in general, but we might like something like the phase gate, the S gate, that's just one zero, zero and an I. Or the T gate, which is one zero, zero exponential of I pi over four. And this is called the pi over eight gate. That's not a typo. It is called the pi over 8 gate because it can also be viewed as a rotation along the C axis. And we might do a rotation RC of some angle theta, which you might define as exponential of I theta over 2 of, of I theta and exponential of minus I theta. That's just the, uh, rotation around the c-axis by some angle theta. And if you choose that angle to be pi over 8, then it's the same as this up to a global phase that's trivial. Now, many papers don't defy the rotation gate this way, but with a division by 2 here. The conventions that you may want to keep track of and check in the paper that you read. Then we can do a rotation also around the x axis. And one around the y axis, and so on and so forth. And we can build up many, many, many gates. And of course, it's not nice having so many gates, so we want to simplify it. We want to reduce it to as few gates as possible. That we don't have to build hundreds of gates. And one way to reduce it is easy to see. If we want to rotate something around the x-axis, let's say I have a qubit, we want to do a rotation around the x-axis with a certain angle. Then I want to, but I don't have the rotation around the x-axis, but I have the other gates. What can I do? Huh? I, I change the basis from x to c. I do the Hadamard gate. Now x is c. Now I rotate around the c-axis with that angle. Then I do another Hadamard gate. And so I don't need this. And so on. And one can then show that it is sufficient for one qubit operations to just have the T gate and the Hadamard gate. With those two gates, you can, can approximate any one qubit operation exponentially one. So in principle, it is enough to have the H gate and the T gate. And those two gates you have to build well, and those two gates can be built well using think, they are the, 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 the topological methods. Yes? If you have a discrete set of gates, you can only ever create a countable number of rotations. Right? Trivially. You have an uncountable number. You, you have complex entries in it, right? And there's an uncountable number of entries. But now I want to approximate it, like I approximate the, 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 you can make the, 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 the error is exponentially small in the number of gates that you choose. That's the, 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 the so-called called, called, Solovic Kital theorem.
they show that it can be done. The best paper explaining it, because there's no, no real reference to that paper, the best paper explaining that is by Dawson and Nielsen. That's in quant pH on the archive. 05, 05, 030. And the Negafast test, test, way of getting a Negafast unitary is by the Welsh et al. And that's archive 1412.5608. They got it down to the shortest sequence of gate, gates that's known to, 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 to approximate any one qubit unitary. Now, so far, we thought only about single qubits. Next, we need to go to two qubits and more. And that's pretty quick now, because there's only one, basically, a classical gate that you need, which is the control not gate. And that gate, if, and that gate there are two qubits coming in. The one is a control bit, that's the dot here, and here I do an XOR. And what that does classically, for a classical gate, is A, B, and this gives me out, so he, here there's A coming in, here there's B coming in, there's A coming out, and there's A, X, or B coming out. Meaning if A is set to 1, I will flip the bit B. If A is zero, nothing happens. So classically, the truth table here is if A, B, and let me do A, X, or B here, when A is zero, one, zero, zero, and zero, one, that's unchanged, zero, and one. And when it's one, then it flips it. That's one and that's zero. Quantum mechanically, it's a matrix now, two by two which is 1, 1 here, the rest is 0, and here when that bit is 1 then I'm flipping it. So it flips that qubit if the control is set to 1 and it does nothing if the control is 0. This is a control knot, when this is 1 then I do a knot operation on this one here. And with this gate, and the T gate and the Hadamard gate, the H, where did I have it? With these three gates, you can build any quantum algorithm you ever want to build. But it's at the same level as me giving you just a pile of NAND gates and I tell you write an algorithm to do whatever calculation you want to do. It's very low level. So in Okay, what I'll show, we will use a, a bit more, a few more gates. To make it simple, I also will use this Y basis change, and I will use an arbitrary C rotation. If you don't have that gate, then read that paper and it tells you how to, to rewrite it into the H and T gates, a long sequence of them which means that any algorithm I tell you, every rotation has to be rewritten into about a hundred or more other gates. And if a rotation takes, uh, and if a gate takes, on iron traps, for example, 10 microseconds, then such a rotation might already take a millisecond. This machine will become very slow. Do you have a question? Okay. Let me mention, so before we use it now, and do things that are classically impossible to do, which we'll do in about five minutes, 
I need to mention one other problem we have. Not only that things are slow and that we can't copy and that we can't read out much, but there's also the problem that our qubits are not perfect. I mentioned the qubits we have now. They live for ion traps hours if you don't touch them. They live for about 100 operations if I do something to them. The super conducting ones live for about 100 microseconds. And then the cat is either dead or alive. So we need to, to, to find some way to, to keep it uh, alive, and that's called, called uh, quantum error the, the, the correction. Classically, we have the same problem. Classical memory is not perfect. Classical computers are not perfect. But we fix it by duplicating information. I keep things in memory and I store an extra parity bit or two parity bits. Or I simply copy it. When I copy it and I have it in three copies, I can keep it forever because when one copy differs from the others, I simply fix it to again be, be like the other two. I can do that because I can copy. Quantum mechanically, I can't copy. So I can't do such a simple code. But there are ways of encoding it that I can fix errors, but it gets much more complex. I don't want to mention the details, but it can be shown that if you have qubits and gates that are good enough, then you can fix, and if you can fix errors faster than they appear, then you can keep a quantum state alive forever indefinitely. But that means you have to be able to fix it fast enough, and that's the, uh, the, the, the threshold. And if you can do about 100 operations on the qubits without an error, then that is just good enough to, in principle, keep a state alive forever. But if you just add the threshold, it means you need an infinite number of qubits, and you have to replicate an infinite number of times to keep it alive. If you have a factor of 10 below, you might just need a million qubits to, have one, to keep one qubit alive. If you have about a factor of 10,000 below, then you might just need a few hundred. So what's really nice now and exciting is that the qubits one has now are just good enough that we can start doing that. But with those qubits we have now, you will need millions to keep one qubit alive for a long time. So not only do we need not just 50 qubits, we might need 50 million qubits, but it's also hard then to build and program it. So we are still a way off. But what we can do with what we have now is we can run things for a few hundred operations. We can do about 100 gate operations on about 20 qubits. That you can do today if you go to Innsbruck, for example. Once we have more qubits that are better, then one could keep it uh, alive for longer. So now, what can we do? Let's say I give you one qubit in those gates. Who has an application? Something that is impossible to do classically. Something that you can sell, that can make money. One qubit. I give you one qubit. You can choose one of the gates and you can do a measurement. Let me initialize the qubit in the state zero. Let me apply a Hadamard gate and let me perform a measurement. I show that in this way. There's a dial and measure what comes out and then a classical bit here comes out. What does this program do? And if it to zero, I apply one gate and a measure. 
this is a perfect quantum random number generator. I start from this state, exactly here again the state 1 over root 2 of 0 plus 1. Then I measure. And the outcome of the measurement is, if quantum mechanics is correct, it is truly random. This is a way how you can get two random numbers, which is just impossible classically, because classical physics is deterministic. Here you can have two imperfect random numbers. You can sell it. You can make money with it. Who needs perfect random numbers? Monte Carlo simulation, I would like to have it all the time, lots of them, but it's a bit expensive to buy it. If I'm into security and I want to have really perfect encryption, then I make a one-time pad. I want a sequence of random numbers that I share secretly with someone. Then we both have the sequence, and then I can use that to encrypt it in an unbreakable way. If I'm a lottery and I want to, uh, the, 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 then I use these balls typically that fly around and pick out numbers. Now that might be biased or fake to somebody could couldn't get manipulated. If I use quantum lotteries, then it's provably perfect, and nobody can sue me for biasing the lottery. Random numbers. What else can we do? If I give you two qubits, I give you two qubits and a few gates. A really useful application. See, we have 20 qubits already out there, so you can get two qubits. You can buy them somewhere, probably. What can you do with two qubits? Peter, you may answer. With two qubits, you can start sharing a secret key, yes. You can do untapable encryption. The one-time pattern I make here, somebody can read it while I mail it to him. With two, what we can do is we can prepare them in a bell state. So I start with them being zero. And then what I can do, okay, what can I do? Where is my I want to find the right notes now. Yeah. Okay, let me just take a qubit here and apply a harder mat. So I have the state here. And now I do a control not operation with the second one. And now the state I get here is 1 over root 2 times 0, 0 plus 1, 1. Because this here was 0 plus 1. When it's 0, this one is unchanged. When it's 1, that one also gets flipped to a 1. So now the two qubits are in the same state, but it's random which one it is. Now I take this qubit and I take it to ETH, Zurich, where I work. Take this qubit, I send it to Microsoft, where Bela works. And then when we have them, then we both measure. Nobody knows what we measure, but we'll measure the same thing because it stays entangled. And we have a shared secret. To turn this into a negative crypto system, we have to be a bit more careful, but that's the, the, the basic idea. If, if you want to know how to turn that into a negative crypto system, then ask me in the break. We cannot only use that to share a secret. We can also use that for something else. Once we have two qubits. I send one qubit to Bela. What can I do? I can use it to teleport information. If 
I send one qubit to Pela and I keep one myself. And then I want to send some state to Pela. And I might not even know the state. Somebody gives me a, a qubit psi. And they want to teleport it to him. What would I have to do classically? Classically, that state is alpha times zero plus beta times one. If I knew the state, which I might not know, but if I knew the state, I would have to send two infinite precision numbers to Bela, which, which in principle needs an infinite number of classical bits. And now here's what I can do. We've done this here. Now, what I can do is I can take this. Where did I have the notes? What I do is I do a control not gate of my unknown qubits with the one qubit that I had from before. Then I measure that qubit. And of that unknown qubit, I do a Hadamard to measure essentially the x component of the qubit. Then I get out two classical bits, which I draw with the double lines. These are two classical bits that I get out. And these two classical bits I send to Pela. And then he does something to, to his bits, that he has a station Q in Santa Barbara. And what he does is, with what he, if this bit is 1, he does an X operation. And if that bit is 1, he does a C operation on his qubit. So if I measured one here, then he applies a sigma c. If I measure one here, he applies a sigma x. I send him two classical bits. He applies this, and then the magic is that out here comes the state psi. I've teleported it just by sending two classical bits. If if you want to see how it works, then what you do is you start with this here, alpha times zero plus beta times one, and you write the state zero, zero, plus one, one, and add the one over root two in front of it. Now you apply the control not operation here, meaning you get an alpha zero, 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 plus beta, uh, plus alpha zero, one, one, plus a beta one, one, zero, plus a beta one zero one, then you, and then in three lines, you see that the state you get depends on if this is one, he has to flip the x component, if this is one, he has to flip the z component. Five minute homework. And it's worth doing because then you see how magically the state is teleported just by sending two classical bits of information. I can't even do it classically. OK, this is magic you can do with two qubits or three qubits you can teleport. Now, after the break, we'll go to negative physics applications. Now, before, I want to show you one more thing, also something that is just impossible to do classically. If I just have two qubits. That is, I give you a function f of one bit. So a function f that goes from 0, 1 to 0, 1. 
And they want you to answer the question whether f of zero is the same as f of one. Is the function constant or not? But I give you a function that you can, can call only once. Given a function f, can you decide whether it's constant or not with a single function call? Then it's obviously not, right? Now, is this interesting? You have to help me think about it. I didn't find an application yet. I think uh, the best, best that was uh, found so far is what if something a terrorist comes and holds the gun to your head and says, tell me whether my function is constant, but you only get a single function call. OK, but it's obviously, classically, it's impossible. Now, quantum mechanically, it can, can be done. If you have a quantum computer, then you can decide that with a single function call. And that shows you kind of how a quantum computer can do much, much more than a classical computer can. How do we implement such a, a, a function? We make it a, a gate. Here's the input x. And here's some input y. And there's my function gate, uf. It must be t -t 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 unitary. And this output, I keep here x, the argument. And the output down here is y xor f of x. So if I feed in 0 here, then here I get, 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 get f of x. And I can use that in a classical way. I feed in the state 0 here and 0 here. OK, so let's feed in zero here and zero here, I get, get like f of zero. I feed in one here and zero here, I get f of one. Now, I use that in my quantum hardware, and that's a quantum version of the function. And I feed in, not zero, but I feed in a superposition. I apply Hadamard gate here after the zero. So I feed in here the state 1 over root 2 of 0 plus 1. What do I get as output? As output, I get 1 over square root of 2 of 0, and the other one is f of 0, plus 1, f of 1. The output contains both function values. Nice. Or I do that with n input registers, and I get the function evaluated at 2 to the n function values. I have the, <laughs> the register here with the function evaluated at all possible inputs. I have it for all values at once. So I have exponential advantage over any classical operation. Or so one thinks at first. Because what happens when I measure the output? When I measure the output, the x collapses to a randomly chosen input. And this one just goes to the function value at that point. So if I measure this, I measure either 0 and the function value at 0, or I measure 1 and the function evaluated at 1. So when I measure it, I just get the function evaluated at a random input. And that is easy to do classically. I choose a random input and then call the function only once for that random input. So what we see here is we have in principle in the quantum register the function evaluated at all possible inputs. But when I read it out, I read only a single value. And it doesn't help me. So what can we do? Who sees the solution?
we have to somehow manipulate the output in such a way that the bitter measure gives me the answer to the question that I want to ask, right? And the question that I want to ask is, is f of zero the same, the same as the f of one? Or basically you want to calculate f of zero xor f of one. If I can somehow make that one qubit gets into this state, and then I measure it, then I know the answer. Let, let me rotate the x with the Hadamard gate and then measure it and see what happens. Okay, yeah, that's, so let's do a Hadamard here and then we measure it. So what do we get here? Now this is a bit complicated. So this can either be zero or one. So now we have to make different. Okay, so I do the rotation of the x. What do I get? Get one over root two. Now I do a rotation on the x with the Hadamard. So I get the zero, I apply the Hadamard. So I get the zero, f of zero. Oh, one over two plus one, f of zero. Plus I get the one, f of one, minus the one, f of 1. Oh, sorry, that's it. Yeah, that's 0. Yeah, 0 plus 1 and this is 0 minus 1. Now, that didn't do it yet. They wanted to do, to do something like this. The trick is, I feed in a one here and do a harder mark in as well. When I do this, when I feed in here a one and a harder mark, and also put that into a super position, that is the Deutsch algorithm, then I get out something very nice. And I might just want to show you the, the teleport. I don't want to show where do you have the notes. Put somewhere, I have it here. So when I do this, then it works out. The, the last bit before the break, and after the break, we then apply two more than two qubits. So, when I have this, then I start from the state one half, and the first qubit is in the state zero plus one, and the second one was in the state zero minus one. So this is the state one half, and I get a zero, zero. Then I get minus a zero, one. I get plus a one, zero. And I get minus one, one. Then I apply the function f to it. This means this goes over into one half of zero, and this is f of zero. Minus, oh, let me put, okay, minus zero, and this is now the f of zero inverted because I do the XO with one. This gives me one and f of one, and this here gives me uh, one and minus the f of one. <laughs> Now, I don't like this too much because I don't like having the function written in here. I want to have a zero or a one here. But what I can see now is, you see, this appears here as the f of zero or minus the f of zero inverted. 
That means if the f of zero is zero, then the zero zero appears with a plus one. But if the f of zero is one, then the zero zero appears with a minus one. Same here, if the f of one is zero, the one zero appears with a plus one. If the f of zero is one, no, so if the uh, f of one is one, then the one zero appears with a minus in front. So let me pull out a minus one to the power of f of zero times one half. And then this gives me a zero zero minus a uh, zero one. And here's the uh, uh, f of 1. So they've pulled out the f of 0. So here, now I can write this as minus 1 to the power of f of 0 x or f of 1 times the 1 0 minus the 1 1. Now we see that the second qubit is always in the state 0, minus 1, 0, minus 1. So this is just the global phase I can just pop away because I can't even measure it. So this is just 1 half of the first qubit is 0 plus minus 1 to the power of f of 0, x or f of 1 times 1, and the second qubit is in the fixed state 0 minus 1. Now I want to measure the x component of this. So now I do an again to, 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 to Hadamard here, and I measure. And that gives me the value of f of 0, x or f of 1. That's the magic. That's easy, isn't it? I don't think you agree. What's easy is that this is a very simple circuit. Four gates, one measurement. It is easy to see that if I have a function gate and apply it, and I call it with the with the super position of inputs, then I get a wave function that contains the function evaluated at all possible inputs. But you've also seen that it's very cumbersome to actually extract the information you want from this. You have it in this big wave function. And if you had the wave function, then you would know the function at all possible values. But having the wave function means you have to know exponentially many numbers, and that takes exponential time, no matter what. You can't just read out a wave function if I give you a quantum state, but you can, can only read out n bits. So the trick is to then come up with an algorithm that takes the state and changes the base in such a way that when you measure the one bit you want to measure, that you get the answer to your question. Once somebody gives you this, calculating is, is a simple exercise. It takes five minutes, and you're done. Coming up with these algorithms is not easy. After the coffee break, we'll apply this to quantum systems. How do we solve quantum spin systems? How do we solve electronic systems, Hubbard model, molecules, materials, whatever? And this is quite a bit easier. It's easier because you know a lot about those systems already. Other questions? Yeah. How hard? Yeah. This was done already. By Estes group in Paris. See, because this is, these are just just some basis changes, some pile sequences you do, the function. That's that's not too hard. What you need to do, if you want to do it, you need to look at the hardware, be it ions, be it 
bit then I guess. Super superconducting qubits. And they typically don't have the gate set that I've used here. I use the Hadamard, the control knot, and there are a few others. They might have different gates. Now what you have to do is here you have to see how can you implement the gates I use in terms of what they can do, then use it. Then you get the big sequence that's not optimized. The trick is then how do you to optimize it? Can you change it a bit to get the shortest possible sequence? But this can be done in the lab. It was done that yeah. teleport can be done, the Deutsch algorithm was done, random numbers you can buy, quantum crypto systems you can buy, so these things exist. What it do in the next hours is that I teach you how can we use that hardware with two, three, four, five, six qubits, we have up to 20 by now, to solve quantum physics problems. And what would we need to solve things that we can't do classically yet? So when will we use it for real hard problems that, uh, that we can't do yet? And that might already be in a few years down the road. And if you help us with better algorithms, then we might make more progress. But because in five years or ten years you'll have these things, or on qubits, you will probably be able to use a quantum computer in the cloud already within the next year, from what I've heard. Yeah. You might have access to 9 qubits somewhere. Of course, 9 qubits is something we can do on a smartwatch, as I said. But at least you can already start using these things soon. As toys at first, and learn. And then in, in 10 years, it will be bigger, and then your student later on will then maybe be run things on a quantum computer, and solve problems, and do a thesis on a quantum computer. And that's why I'm teaching you now how to use it for the time when we, ha ha we have something really interesting. Right now, it's just cool to use them. In 10 years, they might do things that we can't do on any PC. Yeah. So, sorry, how many? Do we have? None. Uh, Maybe. I don't know. So there are those nanowires in, in Delft. If you take two of them with four Majoranas, that would be one topological qubit. Now, we don't know yet whether the end modes there are Majoranas. If they are, then they have a qubit. If they're not, then they don't have a topological qubit. What one has to do is one has to braid the anions in there and show that it is, and that will still take a couple of years. Once one can braid those anions, then one has one topological long time stable qubit. You need not just the qubits, which you might, which you might have already. But the wires could already be thousands of qubits, but we don't have any gates for them yet. You need the qubits and the gate set. Whether they have the qubit depends on whether the end modes are Majorana anions. If yes, then they are. But they can't really initialize them them yet, nor read them out, nor manipulate them. So, so I think that in a few years we'll know whether there are topological qubits in those nanowires. They so they have this these wires and they see modes at the end of the wires that so far look like what one expects from Majorana anions. 
but in order to actually show that those are, 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 are anions, one needs to braid them and show that you pick up the right phases when braiding them, and that has not been done yet. That needs to be shown. That will still take a couple of years, I guess. And then either it works, in which case it's great, we have qubits, or if it turns out to be just a boson or, or a fermion, then okay, bad luck. That didn't work out. But those qubits should live much, much longer and should then make it easier to scale. So we don't even have one yet, but if we have one, then it will be easier to scale it up. No, we don't have one yet. But once we have one, it will not be hard to entangle them. You just braid them. You move one around the other, one end around, and it's entangled. With iron traps, we have 20. Superconducting, nine good ones, or, or a thousand bad ones in D wave. They have a thousand qubits in there, yes. They don't live longer than a few nanoseconds, but they manage to scale it up to a thousand, and that's quite a challenge. They actually build a thousand that work on the same chip. With good qubits, we have nine, and now it takes a while to scale it up. That's hard, scaling it. Scaling and calibrating and testing it. It will happen. Yes, you can build a quantum annealer. That does not need perfect qubits. It can have bad qubits and it still works. The question there is, is it better than a classical computer? And there the answer is nobody knows. They said, OK, it takes decades to build a thousand or more good, logical, stable qubits. And again, well, that will take forever. But there's the chance that using bad qubits, OK, they were the best qubits 10 years ago, so it's not really that bad. But, but what can we do using those qubits that one have if one scales it up and one can build the quantum uh, annealer with them, a quantum annealer can solve optimization problems. This is a big important application. Whether a quantum annealer can solve them better than a classical optimizer, nobody knows, but it's a gamble worth taking, and that's what they tried. So far, one has not seen advantages yet. So it's not clear yet whether it paid off. It works about as fast as my laptop, which by itself is amazing that you can, can build a quantum device that works as fast as the best classical CPU. But it's not really useful as a product. If when you scale it up, when it starts working, can better and better, but it has quantum speed up that one does not know yet, for those problems that one tested it, we didn't see any quantum speed up. They tried. Yeah. Is there a consensus on whether that device is actually a quantum? Well, there's a quantum, yeah. Well, it depends on what you define by quantum. There is consensus that whether the DWF device is a quantum annealer it depends on your definition of quantum. As a physicist, I will say this device uses quantum effects in how it operates. Uh, it uses quantum effects in the way it operates, and its behavior is consistent with what I expect from a quantum annealer. So it looks like a quantum annealer. But it performs worse than a classical annealer. I can simulate it efficiently on a classical computer. And so for a computer scientist, it is, its computational power is the same as that of a classical device. 
and thus it is not a quantum computer in the computer in the scientist sense because it can efficiently simulate it. But we have many bosonic quantum systems, PCs and so on, that they can simulate efficiently. And as a physicist, they still call it quantum. It's still a quantum gas, a PC. But you can solve it by mean field theory. And they say, OK, that's mean field theory, so it's, it's trivial. So if you call a PC a quantum liquid, then D-Wave is a quantum device. If you call it just a classical field, then D-Wave for you might just be a classical computer. Okay. I think there's coffee.